Welcome to the Playing Hooky Podcast with your hosts, Rachel and Nathan, brought to you by UtilityMuffinLabs.com, consistently rated adequate. I could just like edit the entire thing and be like, hey, welcome to the Playing Hooky Podcast. I'm Nathan. Yeah, let's do that. You want to just do that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. No, I don't give a shit. I, I don't believe in self-censorship. However, if your mom doesn't know you're like... You know, doing it, yeah. By now, like, yeah, you're not in your 20s anymore. No, it's true, I'm definitely not. I look less and less like I'm in my 20s with each day. Also, like, let's be frank, we live together, like, yeah, you know, anyways, yeah, yeah graphically, we may have gone a little overboard, but yeah, I don't I think mean, we need to like explain no, no. like all of the deets, but no, but what we need to do is we need to explain what the what is the point of the podcast. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah right, 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 we got off track, yeah. Um, the point of the podcast is, is that. Uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to um, share the things that we love with each other, but also maybe capture some of that, right. right? And share it with, you know, a broader audience of people because we uh, are romantically involved and we're really good friends and we have a ton of fun together, but we're always like ex discovering new things right. um, about each other every day, but also to, like just we have the opportunity to like learn about stuff that we don't know about. Right. And so we thought that would be a fun thing to do for a podcast. Because I think that we both have very specific things that we kind of like, we really enjoy. Yeah. And I know for me, like, when I found out that there were certain things that you didn't know about, I was like, what? Yeah. How was that? A and thing? I think it just happened on the couch. Well, it didn't. No, that was just a reference I didn't get. Never mind. Because you were like, oh, no, no, no. It was the, the Danger Room reference. Uh -huh. right. We were watching Star Trek on the couch just now. Yeah. Uh, Nathan was like, you know, I was surprised. I turned it on while I was cooking. And then it carried over to like while we were eating dinner. Right. And basically, if you put something on and it's like interesting enough for like 15 minutes, like I have to consume all of it. I right. can't walk away. Yeah. No. So we finished the episode. And uh, I couldn't tell if you were like being facetious or not, but you were like, what's the hollow deck? Is that like a hologram on a deck? And I was like, well, well kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, is it like the danger room? And I'm like, what's the danger room? And then Nathan goes, you know, the danger room where Professor Xavier trains the X-Men. <laughs> Professor Xavier. And right. he points to the screen and then like a good solid second goes by and then like an explosion went off in my brain and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> Patrick Stewart, Jean-Luc Picard, Professor Xavier, right. all the connections. And Nate was just like, you're ridiculous. <laughs> you're so silly that you never made the connection. I didn't know it was called the danger room though. Oh yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it was made in the 60s, you know? It's like... Yeah, but you knew it was... Like, that's the point. That's the whole point, right. right? So not only are we, like, learning about different elements of pop culture that we both like that we never had the either the inclination or the time to be exposed to, but this is also a way for us to kind of play hooky from that stack of dishes, from our work, from, you know, maybe uh, the other, you know, responsibilities, whether they're um, self-inflicted or the world is right. putting them on us. It's just a way for us to step back and have a little bit of fun right. um, and in more of like perhaps a more structured format than we would have done otherwise. But like mm -hmm. it really kind of holds us accountable to making sure that Nate sits down and watches a Disney movie and I sit down <laughs> and watch some wrestling. Well, and, and I mean, I think that also... Uh, it gives us the opportunity to maybe look at things with our our mate, with our respective counterpart, and maybe give them an opportunity that we haven't given them in the past, right? Like I, you know, we, you just mentioned... Oh, the things, giving right, the things right, an opportunity. Yeah, the things. Yeah. And, and maybe like some people can take away to like, you know, yeah, your significant other might like some weird stuff, some out there stuff. But like, I mean, it's all kind of just... Stuff. It's mm -hmm. right. It's just like pop culture. It's mm -hmm. just like all everything's a little nerdy. Right. Yeah. And I feel like, too, like especially I feel like people go through phases like when they're really young, they're very protective of the stuff they love and everything else is garbage. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of go through a period in your 20s where you don't have like time to start consuming things that much. You know, you're right. you're in college or you're working for the first time. And you're really busy. You kind of already have established your friend group and your hobbies. And so you're not 
taking in new culture. Right. And then when you get to your 30s, you start getting like weirdly nostalgic for the stuff you were into as a kid and a teenager. And you yeah. become really protective of that stuff you love again. Right, and you right. kind of it's like the worst Star Wars fans are the little kids and the dudes in their 30s and 40s that like Star Wars is like the only thing in the world to them and they right. hate everything else. Well, you know what and, I mean, you know, it's like you, you hear those those arguments like, well, you know, extended universe or like what, you know, whatever. Like, I, yeah, I, but I, I get it. Right. I right. understand why they have them. But I don't, I don't get Star Wars. Right. It's just not a thing that I find overly entertaining. I'm not bashing Star Wars. No, no, no. It's, you know, sci-fi. Right. But like... But if, if it was something I loved, right. you would be willing to give it a shot. Of course. Unfortunately, I can't share that with you because I too didn't... Star Wars didn't hit me at the right time in my no. life. Yeah, we we talked about. And this. you're kind of more at a better position to be a Star Wars fan because well, you're just a couple years older than so, me. So so the thing about it is, Star Wars. Like when I was born, I was kind of born in between. Yeah. And unfortunately, like I guess for Star Wars, not really unfortunate for me, but like my my jam was GI Joe, mm -hmm. and GI Joe kind of like came out at a time that was in between Star Wars movies. Yeah, and they were kind of like. Thanks to the G.I. Joe documentary you had me watch, which was really cool. It seems like the G.I. Joe action figures were kind of in competition with the Star Wars. Yeah. So it's like if you were being heavily marketed to and the yeah. G.I. Joe stuff was hitting you really hard, then yeah. probably it would have shut out a lot of the Star Wars stuff. Well, also, I think, too, like my parents were not like big Star Wars fans. Like my parents, you know, were like in their very early 20s when they had me. So like when I was five or six years old. Mm hmm or four years old or whatever, like they were younger than we are now. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's like, they were essentially what we would consider kids. Yeah. No, that's crazy to think about. Like yeah. if I, if I were my mom, I'd have a 14 year old right now. Right. Like it's weird. Right. Yeah. And absolutely. I can't, I can't imagine that. Right. So, so <laughs> like thinking about it from that perspective, like both of my parents were under 30 and obviously I don't think that they had the same level of nostalgia that we have for the stuff that we were kids. However, I do know my dad grew up with G.I. Joe. Mm -hmm. And yeah. my dad grew up with the 12-inch G.I. Joes mm -hmm. with the action figure, right? And we, we learned watching that documentary, and some of us may have already known, G.I. Joe was like the first action figure, right. right? It wasn't a doll. It was an action figure. And so I feel like that may have played a part in it. But, like, they just weren't big sci-fi mm -hmm. people. Like, right. my, my mom is a big horror fan. My mm -hmm. mom was real big into... You know, the Twilight Zone yeah, and, yeah. you know, stuff like that. So she was into like more psychological horror. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of like my dad coupled with my mom kind of kept me in a fantastic sense grounded in reality. Right. Hence, like guys running around with guns mm -hmm. fighting terrorists instead right. of guys in space running around fighting terrorists. Like, you know, right. it's just, so it never really, like I watched Star Wars and I was like, oh, that's cool. But it didn't resonate with me like it did with people older than me mm -hmm. and people maybe even a little bit younger than me who like watched Return of the Jedi and that was kind of like their first exposure. Yeah. So didn't do it for me. So right. G.I. Joe was kind of like my thing. But anyways, like we we're way off topic. Yeah, who cares? Yeah. If people we, are going to listen or they're not going to listen. <laughs> right, right, this true. is this is our This is our time. True. It's like the movie The Goonies. This is our time. Down here. <laughs> Up there is their time. Sorry. God. Ooh. I'm just like. No, that's okay. I, I, you I know, need I need to fucking have children so that I can understand what's like hot now. Like what's on Nickelodeon these days. I'm just um, going to like be stuck in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Well, and then we'll have kids and we'll just like recycle our old nostalgic items and like to, I, and I was talking about my brother like right I, I think that's what he's doing oh like, with the so you want to like explain the, a little with bit the, with so your... yeah my brother is like seven years younger than me mm -hmm. and he just got married mm -hmm. and he congratulations has a, yes he has a child on the way congratulations and uh yeah so can't my, wait to my, cuddle that baby my mom was just explaining to me how he bought like four hundred dollars worth of legos awesome and I was like, okay. But she was kind of judgy about yeah, it. Yeah. She was like, your, your brother bought $400 for the Legos. And I was like, well, you know, for me, it made a lot of sense. I yeah. was like, well, he's like. Perhaps don't tell her how much we spent on books at Gen Con. <laughs> right, right. We, we, won't get, we won't get into that. But, um, <clears throat> you know, he's, he's not like a gamer like we are. Right. But, you know, he comes from the same, you know, he's my younger brother. So mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> all of my toys and all that stuff. That stuff he ended up with. Right. And I'm just like, well, you know, he just got married. He's got a baby on the way. Mm-hmm. He's just trying to like hold on to a little bit of that that childhood. Yeah, yeah. You know? Just trying to keep some of that. Right. Because like we all find the the times that are the most fun mm-hmm. that we always look back to are like our early childhood or like our teen years, right? right? Like if you think about the music you listen to today, yeah, you probably don't listen to a lot of popular music today. No, not a ton. Because you don't identify with it. Mm-hmm. Because like pop music is made for kids. It's yeah. made for like your teens and your tweens. Yeah. And so like if you think back, like what was the most fun time, you know, when you're exploring and, and growing, mm-hmm. that's probably the music you're going to listen to. And I can point clearly to, for me, yeah. like I listened to music from when I was a kid, mm-hmm. like classic rock and classic pop. And and how often have you heard like Africa by Toto? So many times. You know? uh, and yeah. I also listened to like, mid to late 90s industrial and heavy metal. Mm-hmm. Why? Because that's when I was in high school. That's like right. what was cool when I was in high school. Right. And, you know, aside from the very like random kind of uh, band or experience, like I'm not listening to more new stuff. Like, I don't right. know. I don't know what's new. Occasionally, like a new metal band will pop up on my radar, but it's still just like kind of recycling. It's like the sound. similar sound. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's no, not groundbreaking. Like... It's not, right. you know. And and like, I I didn't start listening to hip hop until I was in my 20s, but I can't stand hip hop from today. Like, I didn't grow up with it. I didn't like it when I was growing up. Oh, yeah. You're not a fan of the, um, uh, what's it called? The big thing. And I'd say I'm too old. Like the mumble rap. It's just like. Mumble rap. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it is, it just doesn't sound good to me. So Mm. anyways, we decided let's do this podcast. Let's talk about. Let's pick a thing mm-hmm. from each of our our respective orbits of pop culture. Right, joy. It doesn't necessarily have to be from our childhood, but we'll, you know, yeah. if if we go there, this episode we're kind of going there, so it makes yeah. sense. We'll be a little bit more nostalgic, but I think there's a couple of things we'll talk about that even like as recently as the past year. Hell, maybe like I could probably do a whole. Up- episode on eat the elephant the new perfect a perfect circle album that came out last (laughs) april like i there was like a solid month and a half where that was just like every time i turned on music that's what i was listening to so but you know maybe that wouldn't have necessarily been your first pick but we could do a deep dive on that you know doesn't whatever there are no rules shut up nerd stop judging me (laughs) so um anyways this week we decided that we were going to we're gonna like review respectively um I, a little background about me. Mm. Uh, I am a, I guess you could say like a former wrestling fan, yeah. um, which is kind of a misnomer. I, I don't watch wrestling anymore. Right. I don't actively participate in wrestling. However, I listen to wrestling podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> so like I, I listen to like other people talk about wrestling. So, so like I'm mildly like, informed so about So you kinda know what's going on today. Yeah, like yeah. in a vague sense. I'm mm-hmm. like someone who stopped watching soap operas but still picks up like soap opera weekly mm-hmm. and like, you know, reads through and knows that like right. you know, whatever is going on in general hospital. Mm-hmm. But I don't watch it. Right. Um but like wrestling for me in high school and like post high school was uh was for a while was a very big part of my life. So like mid to late nineties. Yeah, 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 definitely. So would you like to tell the people listening at home what you had me watch from this era? Yes, because I, I was not familiar. I had Rachel watch um, the WWF King of the Ring nineteen ninety eight, mm. and um, why I had her watch this was uh, for a reason I didn't tell her until after she was like in the middle of watching it. But mm-hmm. basically, uh. When I was growing up, for those of you who are familiar with wrestling at all, I was a WCW fan. I I was like into the NWO and like the whole Bill Goldberg thing and well, you know whatever. So I would have had con- like I probably knew I would have I would have known that WWF was a thing and mm-hmm. I would have known that WCW was a thing. Here's how I would have categorized them in my mind at the time. WWF is like the Sears of wrestling and WCW is like the Walmart of wrestling. <laughs> like it seemed like it was on at weirder times, had a lower production value and like less good costuming in its wrestlers. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll paint you a, a, prick, a picture, a picture. Um, basically in like the mid nineties, mm-hmm. WCW, uh, world championship wrestling and the WWF, the world wrestling federation, um, essentially began competing like really hardcore competing against one another. Right. The WCW was 
a bunch of money was spent and, and it was really heavily promoted. And I won't go deep into the politics with you, but essentially um, the like Turner Broadcasting Company and TBS and mm-hmm. and all like they decided like we're going to take this wrestling and we're going to push it because it's been like a major source. It's been, it's been like a, a cornerstone of our broadcasting since the beginning. Mm-hmm. And so some some people in authority, and again, I'm not going to waste people's time. They can look all this stuff up on their own. But basically, these two companies like went head to head. Right. And the WWF had always been like, like kind of the standard, the industry standard, right? Like they, they, that's where Hulk Hogan came from. That's where, you know, Andre the Giant and WrestleMania mm-hmm. and like, so, you know. This is the WWF. This is the WWF. Yeah. So like the WWF was kind of like the gold standard of wrestling uh, on television. Mm-hmm. However, the WCW was, you know, a, a lot of people in the South, that's like, that was, you eat dinner and you watch WCW, right? Gotcha. So anyways, long story short. They start to go head to head on Mondays. Yeah, for like, ratings. B- right, for ratings. Like they're <clears throat> they're on at the same time. Okay. So it kind of created like a golden age for pro wrestling. Mm-hmm. And I was a WCW fan, uh, and uh, other no for no other reason other than like I just turned it on, and like the NWO was kind of like really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like black and white, and seemed like very and like I was a rebellious kid, right? right. So like you know seeing like these. Like guys that don't give a shit about wrestling and they're just coming in and messing with the establishment. So that's what I was into. Mm -hmm. Right. And as a side effect of that, Mm -hmm. I started watching a lot of like Japanese death matches. And and so I I started to kind of know some of like the the deeper intricacies of wrestling. Mm -hmm. You know, I started to know faces instead of just like. The, the properties. And so of, the Dap- Japanese, the Japanese death matches, that was like kind of like a more extreme yeah. professional wrestling. So it's all kind of professional yeah. wrestling and then it's a bit scripted. Right. But the right. Japanese death matches were like more extreme in that you right. a lot more physical danger. For, for, you know, for lack of a better way of describing it, yes. And there was a third wrestling company as well. I don't know chronologically like where they started to fit in. But there's ECW, right? Uh, yeah, I think I've heard of that. Now ECW Is it extreme? had like they were you know, so it was extreme championship wrestling. So mm-hmm. of course, I you know I get started on this WCW, and I kind of you know I go over to the WWF at mm-hmm. the time. They're now the WWE, but at the time, and like I kind of watched some of their stuff, and it didn't really appeal to me, and I just never really got into it, right? Mm-hmm. But like this ECW extreme wrestling, and like bloody and people are throwing themselves through tables and like it was very fitting for the time right right it's like it's like a time and a place that can't exist again right. couldn't possibly but anyways this is what we call the attitude era right okay. it's like more violence more blood more sex more you know more of everything mm-hmm. we, I, I tried to i tried to say while we were watching this that like you know they're coming up with more realistic plot lines but that's not really true mm-hmm. they're just like less focused on like the the characters, like the Hulk Hogan's and the the junkyard dogs and the that that duds, you know, yeah. like like now it's just like it's kind of more badass, of like, like the plot line rather right. than like the one off. Right, character it's like, to, it's like yeah. you, you got you know your Stone Cold Steve Austin. So, anyways, I I I had I had sort of resigned myself to being a WCW and ECW fan, mm-hmm. and WWF was just like what the assholes watched, right? <laughs> but. Um, one time, uh, when this pay-per-view aired in 98, um, a kid that I hung out with that I was actually a member of my first D and D gaming group, mm-hmm. he had a black box. So everybody okay. would come over and watch all the wrestling pay-per-views. And so what is a black box for people who might uh, be too young to know? So a black box was something that you got, mm-hmm. um, so that you could illegally get pay-per-views and cable channels. Okay. Uh, again, another thing that was kind of like time and place, right? The cable companies learned to work around them mm-hmm. and they're not really a thing anymore. I don't know if they are. It doesn't really matter. Right. It's not imperative to this conversation. Um, but he wouldn't pay for him. He just had a black box, right, like okay. a descrambler. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, so I went and I watched this pay per view, and I was like, you know, it's kind of like whatever. I'm just going to watch this pay per view and you know hang out with the guys, and you know it was like a place I could go underage and smoke. So who cared, mm-hmm. right? So we watched this, and this is the first pay per view that I ever see, and uh, for WWF, and it at 
first pay-per-view like adult right i right. had watched like the wrestlemanias when i was a kid but right. that was just kind of like whatever um but this was like adults like you know almost 18 like holy shit formative mm -hmm. pay-per-view and um we can talk a little bit about what it was that you saw because this i felt was like really important for me because mm -hmm. It really kind of like changed my perspective on both wrestling and on the WWF and what was being offered at the time. Right. And like really informed my my further mm -hmm. adventures in wrestling. OK, so I sat down and I watched all of the King of the Ring um, from 1998, the main event of the night. What everybody was waiting for was The Undertaker. Well, supposedly. Right. It was, um, you know, the, the whole thing is, is built around that it's going to be like two wrestlers competing for King of the Ring. But that was actually the third to the last fight. I think then the big, you know, culmination, the big climax right. of the night was the second to last fight, which was Undertaker versus Mankind. And then the very last fight was Kane versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. Right. And Kane said that if he didn't win the title from Stone Cold Steve Austin, he was going to light himself on fire. Himself on fire yeah this, this is the kind they of had shit. gasoline cans right, right, next to right, the ring right. so so yeah um a lot of people they may not even remember like uh, if they think back they might not even remember that this was like a king of the ring mm -hmm. because it's so widely known by like the hell in the cell the hell in the cell yeah that was kind of like what you were waiting for at the end of the night it's like the king of the ring was like an afterthought it was basically just like the vehicle for us right. to consume the, the hell in the cell so where i like at this point in 1998, when this came out, so here's here's kind of my perspective on wrestling at this time, just mm -hmm. so you know. So when I was a little girl, like mm, three, four, five, six, my grandfather, who was from the South, he really liked to watch professional wrestling on Sunday mornings. I think that's when it was on Sunday mornings, like after the church was on TV and then like wrestling would come on on Sundays. And sometimes maybe it would come on Monday evenings, but this was like the late 80s. And so I was like exposed to, I'd watch it with them, right? Because I was little, I didn't have anything else going on and wrestling. It's fun, like, you know, people and fun characters and fun um, costumes or whatever. So this was like your Hulk Hogan, your Macho Man Randy Savage, um, your Andre the Giant time period, the guy who always went, whoo! What was his name? His name is Ric Flair. Ric Flair, yeah. So there's like all the Ric Flair. And so this was something I was exposed to when I was little and then thought nothing of it. Like, you know, didn't hang out with my grandparents as much. And then I became a teenager and I was in high school. And I see all these people with these like 316 t-shirts on. I just So I just moved to like small town Indiana. I see all these people wearing 316 t-shirts on. I just assume everybody is super religious until I kind of catch on that this is a wrestling thing. And I'm a freshman in high school around this time and i'm like what the hell everybody's all these boys are so into wrestling and in my mind i'm like isn't wrestling like really pro played out like wasn't this popular when we were all like tiny children and now mm -hmm. all these boys like you know 14 15 16 17 year old guys are like super into wrestling and wearing stone cold steve austin t-shirts this class oh my and, god they were everywhere yeah no people loved wrestling at this yeah. time like it was huge and um I didn't get it, but I knew it was a thing. Like I knew who the under, I knew who all these people were because you couldn't help because it was everywhere. So if right. you were this age in the nineties, I even told my friend, Anna, I texted her like, she was like, Hey, you want to come over and do a thing? I'm like, Oh, I'm watching nineties wrestling with Nathan. It's this, this, and this. <laughs> and I was like, it's kind of silly. Right. And she goes, Oh no, I loved it back in the nineties. So she was like, she either right. thought it was fun to watch or she had friends who, I don't know. Oh, it, But that's like, so wrestling kind of like nearly perished mm -hmm. because of its own kind of like childish wholesomeness, right? Mm. And there was all kinds of things that were going on at the time where it was just like they couldn't – just it's like the wheels were spinning, right? right? But they couldn't – there was no momentum. And you started to see the rise of like – so, so there's a there's a couple of terms in wrestling: the heel and the face, right? right? So the heel is your bad guy, right? Your bad guy tries to accumulate heat, right? He mm -hmm. wants to get booed. He wants to be the bad guy. And then you have your face, right? And your face is like your traditional good guy. That's mm -hmm. like the guy that's like the hero, and you know, take your vitamins and say your prayers. Well, like for wrestling to survive in the television era. Like, they had to evolve, right? They had to, like, change what they were offering because as you grow up and you become smarter, mm -hmm. you start to go, well, this is, like, I'm, I don't care, right. right? We want, as people, 
We want three dimensional entertainment. You know, it's like we can't just we can't just rely on the old like carnival barker days of like, you know, here's the villain Ric Flair and he's mm -hmm. he's uh, so handsome and he can barely keep these gators on the ground, right? Like right. we can't rely on that. And so you start to see the the rise of like a more like f uh, more freedom in in the development of these storylines where you start to blur mm -hmm. the lines between the fantasy world that wrestling builds and mm -hmm. the reality mm -hmm. of of real life. The, the, there's a there's an insider term for that as well, but it's like so much vocabulary. Oh, oh my god! Like wrestling, there's like we could sit here for days and talk yeah. about just you the have vocabulary. It, I mean, at a disadvantage because I don't know this much about Disney. And, I just know I and, like and, it, and that's that's <laughs> that's fair. Like, I, but I, like I, I don't you know I don't want to admire you in that stuff because it's not really important, mm -hmm. right? It's just like what you're seeing. Is and and I'll I'll be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, you're and geeking out a little bit, but I like. Of course, it. I encourage it. But I'll be perfectly honest with you. Like watching this with you. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is kind of lame. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, because you so, can you can never go back. Right, exactly. Yeah, and and full disclosure, I've experienced similar things, and when we watched Aladdin. But so let me kind of yeah, break down please. into this. So we sat down to watch wrestling. Uh, Nathan, I think, got the the old pay per view from like the WWE online or some kind of service. The WWE service. Network. It's only twenty dollars a month or something. Is that all I, it is? I and you can watch all the wrestling you, you want. You can watch all the wrestling you want. All the historical. Is your first month free? Your first month is free. Then that's all they're we need to say. They're not sponsoring this at all. <laughs> yeah, no, they're not. We don't not. have sponsors. We have one podcast. <laughs> we have like 15 followers on, on Twitter. So Thank you, yeah. all of you. Yeah, um, but we're not sponsored. No. By so anyway, uh, we watch it, and I'm diligent, right? I'm a student of life, and I'm better at being a student and taking notes than almost anything else in the world, right? So I sit down with my notebook and my pen, and I'm like, I'm going to take notes. And I start to take notes on every single match. Who 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 the the opponents are? Who the winner is? What were the major highlights? What were the silly ridiculous things? And then I realize there's like six or seven matches before we even get to the who gives a fuck match, right? <laughs> right. And I'm like I'm kind of losing steam. I'm like okay, but it was all entertaining. Some of it was very like. What is the word homoerotic? <laughs> is that that is like, a word that I will accept you to use? Yeah, there was one guy. Oh, geez, let's see if I wrote down his name. It was it JJ? Oh, Je Jeff. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. Is that he? Was he the one wearing the um? Yeah. The, the silver outfit. Double double J. Double J. Double J. Jeff Jarrett. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like um, I, I wrote down. Uh, that he he looked ridiculous, right? <laughs> like he looked so silly. I mean, like who would who would root for him to win? I don't think anybody would root for him to win. Jet Jarrett versus Ken Shamrock, and Ken Shamrock ultimately won, yeah. right? To go on and face The Rock. Interesting that you would use the, the word ultimately because oh, Ken Shamrock was an ultimate, ultimate fighter, fighter right? right? Yeah, so he was like a real UFC guy, and then probably his body started to break down a little bit, and he's like, "How can I, yeah. you know, support myself and my family? I'll do professional wrestling," and he killed it yeah um because he looked like an action figure S strangely enough it's like a weird career choice because like you, you can it seems like you can go from a like a professional fighter to a wrestler really well mm -hmm. but the opposite like going from a professional wrestler to a professional fighter yeah. uh, it's like a 50 50 crapshoot it's like two different really two different skills yeah it's very hard to get punched in the face after 30 yeah i mean Yes, that's true. Yeah. I would agree. Um, but anyway, I was saying that Jeff Jarrett, he came out wearing this like silver leotard, but it's like the pants were silver. And then there was like a, 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 um, a silver kind of choker that went up around his neck. His back was bare. And then from the choker were three long silver stripes that went over his nipples and then through his center. And I think I wrote down, he looks like he's Freddie Mercury's wet dream. <laughs> like he, it, he, it was, but he was probably JJ, Jet Jarrett. Double J. Double J. Sorry. Jeff Jarrett. That's okay. Sound. I mean, it's like, they're all convenience store names, right? Yeah. Double J. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to the double J to pick up some Advil and a Slurpee. Like, so anyway, like, he was probably, of all the wrestlers that we watched that night, with the exception of Kim Shanrock, probably, like, the most cut. Like, all of the wrestlers definitely look like big guys, but they looked really puffy. Like, they were very muscular yeah. and very strong. Even The Rock, like, it's he didn't look like The Rock like yeah. you know him now. Like, The Rock now is, like, the most impressive human yeah. specimen, but The Rock back in 1998. Yeah, definitely more than he was back then. Yeah, like, he was a big guy, and he was really strong and very muscular, but they're all kind of puffy. You know, I noticed that, too. But Double J was, like, cut. Like, he looked like he was at the gym and ate zero carbs ever. 
Yeah, that was the one thing that I noticed too. Like, I don't know if that's a holdover from like those like Southern wrestling days, but like all of the wrestlers, but for the most part, like ninety five percent of them, mm -hmm. they did have that kind of like puffy, water weighty kind of, yeah. you know, like now. And, and later on from there, like in the 2000s, like you start to see these wrestlers that are like really cut. Mm -hmm. But like wrestlers were back then were kind of like, and, and they I wouldn't were kind call, of poorly defined. Yeah. Like I wouldn't call them fat. No. But, but like now they look like bodybuilders. Yeah. Now right? they look like they are spending as m much time in the gym as they are sleeping. Yeah. Like it's crazy. Um, but anyway, so... So Ken Shamrock ultimately won. The Rock won all of his fights. They go to do King of the Ring, right? That's the whole point of the of the pay per view. That's what it's titled, mm -hmm. right? Right. right? Right. So I, I know who The Rock is, right? I like Dwayne jo Johnson. I'm a red blooded American woman, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm gonna root for The Rock. I did, I had heard Ken Shamrock's name before, but I didn't really get it. And his whole shtick was this that he like flexed his arms and like had his neck veins pop out, whereas The Rock <laughs> was just starting to become The Rock, right? As we knew him, it's very charismatic. Char yeah, starting to kind of have that swagger. He had the eyebrow, but yeah. I don't. He wasn't the. He wasn't like the main act, right? right? So, yeah. So, so, so can you explain that? Because right. you explained it to me while you're watching. So it. the Rock at this point in time, the Rock is coming off of being Rocky Maivia, right? Mm -hmm. Who's like the most obnoxious, like curly haired, stupid costumed, dumb smiling faced, right? Like most annoying wrestler, right? Right. So. He gets something called go home heat. Okay. Right. Go home heat is like what I explained earlier. Like heat is something that that you want mm -hmm. when you're a heel. Go home heat. It's kind of like the booze. Right. Uh, also known as X Pac heat mm -hmm. is when like they really hate you. Like they actually like they actively actually hate like you. they don't just hate your character. Mm -hmm. They're they're like you are a douchebag you suck mm -hmm. fuck you specifically mm -hmm. and so there's a fine line between that but he had just sort of transitioned into like the character the rock right and he was a member of the nation of domination at the time and mm -hmm. so he was playing to that that heel role but he was starting to like really show that sort of dominant charismatic like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you you know think sort of yeah. mentality. can you smell what the rock is right cooking? right yeah. he wasn't quite there he was only he about was, like a year and a half right. away right he was very like close to exploding as like a like top superstar right so and of course now he is like one of the highest paid actors ever and right. is right. in everything and everybody loves he's him. like one of the few professional wrestlers to ever like really transcend professional mm -hmm. wrestling like and really become like a true like hollywood yeah. icon. can we just can we just talk about the rock for a minute and pause yeah. like he really is like a freaking impressive person. Yeah. Like he's really, really smart. He's incredibly talented. I mean, he's not a bad actor. No. Like, I mean, he couldn't have gotten this far if he was bad. I, I, he's so, I do have to say, though. He's so charismatic. Yeah, go ahead. I have to say that there are very few movies I've watched with The Rock in them. I don't really know, like, why Rock is so famous. Mm-hmm. Because, like, I really don't ever watch movies with him in it. But also, I don't really ever watch Fast and Furious movies. There you go. Yeah. And so I know, like, those are huge. Yeah. But I don't really understand why. Well, I think, yeah, he's been in a lot of movies. He's probably just been in, like, he's... So you like action movies? Mm -hmm. I could be totally wrong, but I think with the exception of the Fast and the Furious movies, I'd say most of his action movies have been action comedies, mm -hmm. right? Which probably isn't your bag, right? right. Who knows? But, you know, maybe we should have, like, you know, when it's, like, a cold winter day and we're both off around Christmas, we should... I really want to, like, watch all of the Fast and the Furious movies in one <laughs> go. Like, you know, Harry Potter, psh, Lord of the right. Rings, psh, who cares about that? I want to watch all the Fast and the Furious movies for, in a row because I actually really, really like the first one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, the original Vin Diesel, what's his name, who died, I forget. Paul Walker. Paul Walker, that first one, it was really, really good. God. Damn it, Rachel. I'm sorry. No, I forgot. Okay. I'm just kidding. God rest his soul. I'll make the sign of the cross. I feel, I feel a little bit bad. I can't remember everybody's name. Anyway, yeah, but I like The Rock. I think he's like a very dynamic, charismatic person. He's the type of person who could run for office and people would take him seriously. I mean, as long as he's got a political stance. I, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm not saying I'd vote for him. I'm not saying I wouldn't. But I'm saying he could run for office and he'd have a shot. But he, he see, oh, well, and I, I would say at least if you take like into account the last two years of the political scene in this country. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Don't, I he would, could be the next I president. I wouldn't count him out. Yeah. I wouldn't. But anyways, 
Let's talk about... Back to wrestling. Right. Let's Sorry. let's talk about the I, King of the Ring. Yeah. So anyway, the King of the Ring match goes, I'm watching it. I'm rooting for The Rock. Because I know The Rock and Kim Shamrock's... Kim Shamrock's not done much to, like, impress me, right? As far as, like, being a character that I want to support, right? Right. And I don't have any of the background of Rocky Maivia being kind of a douche, right? I'm just, I know The Rock. Right. And The Rock at this time is, like, 26 years old, so he looks like a baby. Yeah. So they're wrestling, and I'm getting, like, I realize I'm kind of starting to get into it. I'm like, every time, like, you know, one of them gets down and pins the shoulders of the other one, and the ref goes in and hits one, two, and then they kick up their shoulders at the last one. I'm like, ah! Like, I'm getting really into it. Yeah. And, like, The Rock has, like, pinned Ken Shamrock a couple times, and, or, like, three times in a row. And they're both, like, panting, and they're both playing it up a lot. And The Rock's, um, you know, facial expressions are just totally over the top and ridiculous, but it's, like, fun. And I'm, like, I'm, like, oh, like, I'm getting frustrated. And it's, like, they're just building anticipation. At the end of the day, I'm very disappointed. Ken Shamrock ends up winning the match. I don't understand why. Well, it's like watching a piece of drywall beat the rock. Well, like you know, you know I mean, I'm, I was gonna say you have to you have to then look at like okay, Ken Shamrock may have won the King of the Ring. Yeah, but I feel like the Rock really won life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The rock. the last I heard from Ken Shamrock was he was like fighting in some off brand fight organization. And he was fighting a guy who has since passed away. Mm -hmm. But, it, like, this fight organization was well known for its um, reticence to drug test. Oh. And also, um, perhaps, rumors may indicate that Ken Shamrock threw the fight. So, okay. you know, it doesn't always work out for everybody. But right. Ken Shamrock, as I was kind of telling Rachel at the time, I was like, you know, five years before or five years after, he probably could have made a big splash, but he just wasn't like, he didn't have the ring presence. Mm -hmm. He's just like, ah, very scary, intimidating mm -hmm. guy, but he just didn't have, yeah. he didn't have the charisma right. to be a good wrestler. Yeah, yeah. Like, you you really got the sense some of these people were just performers, mm, right? Yeah. And some of them could just take a beating. Yeah. Um, like Double J, very much a performer, right? Mm -hmm. um, the he Rock. was recently inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, I might oh, add. well, good for him. Well, yeah. Was he wearing his silver jumpsuit <laughs> when that happened? Because well, he should have been. You know what? It, and it's funny that you, you're kind of like laying into him a little bit because he's not super well respected in like the wrestling fan world mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. Um, that's... We'll, we'll, maybe we'll explore that years yeah, from now. We can go down that road another right, we'll time. Have, we'll have like a true Hollywood story. He just definitely had the most Double memorable J. and the most silly outfit. Like even sillier than the guys that came out in like 90s flannels and kilts. Like, <laughs> the headbangers? Yeah. yeah, the headbangers. <laughs> yeah, that's how far back we were. We were at the headbangers. Also, I want to give a special shout out to probably one of the most embarrassing matches. And it, like... I, I was I was kind of glad that it was on this pay-per-view where they had Al Snow oh, yeah. and his mannequin head <laughs> and he had to wrestle like with the two hots or two sexies or whatever. Oh, I don't even know. Yeah. Maybe you wrote them down. I, I did. It, it didn't matter too much. Too much. A tag team with too hot and too sexy. Look this match up if you've not seen it. It's quite and Al an embarrassment. Snow and the head. Right, right. Al Snow and his mannequin head. Yeah, he's that like he wrote help me on. Yeah, the Al Snow is crazy. His character's crazy, yeah. and he has his tag team partner is like a mannequin head. And uh, and like crazy, like the the most like stereotypical, like silly crazy. Yeah, like like I've got this head and I talk to it and it talks to me like like someone who wanted to play a Malkavian but never read the book. Totally, and came to LARP. totally couldn't. Yeah. It could not like you couldn't have a character like that today. Yeah, because it's just it's so, so insulting. offensive. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. incredibly offensive and like yeah. really reductive. Well, to be fair, everything I watched was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. Like, yeah, and, uh, and again, like you could. There's no way you could have done like, any like of that Sable, stuff. Like Sable, the female wrestler, gets yeah. her ass slapped. We, we and, saw like we saw yeah. like a, like they like diminished the importance of of mental health mm -hmm. and like sexually assaulted someone mm -hmm. and there was it was just like every now i know why in the first episode from last week when we recorded you're like you may be horribly offended by this <laughs> right, <'cause laughs> and i was like really so... it's just wrestling yeah no it was but it was wrestling in an era where they were just like hey fuck it just do it yeah. right nobody cared and it like went on like that until like the early 2000s right. and and then it was just like culture changed mm -hmm. and so wrestling had to change and like now it's very saccharine and mm -hmm. everything's very deliberate and there's like 
you know, maybe a little thing or, you know, here or there that's like, oh, a little shocking, but it's like not what it was then. Right. Well, so getting into the shocking piece. <clears throat> so we all know that wrestling is scripted usually who's going to win, who's going to lose. But, you know, physically, it is very hard on the body. It's like apparent if you sit down and watch it. Like, you know, maybe they're not actually punching each other in the face, but those are real slaps they're taking to the chest. Those are real falls right. that they have to practice and learn how to do. And those got to be painful, too. I mean, like some of those, I don't know what they're all called, but some of those maneuvers, like if you land the wrong way, you could break someone's neck. Yeah. You get like two, three, 300 pound guys that are just like flinging each other around and pile driving into like what looks like a pretty hard mat. Right. So you have to be physical, good physical shape. And, and you're probably have a good chance of getting hurt if you're not training right right so it's like that being said it's all scripted okay well <laughs> then the hell in the cell comes on and so to set this up you have the undertaker who's like this like seven foot tall scary you know has been kind of a wwf star up until this point and was for quite a long time after that even yeah and he's like evil retired. and demonic yeah only like three or four years ago right i i think i remember hearing that so anyway and then he, there's like some plot going on where there's like a, we don't need to yeah, go into it. It's right. just, it's too, I, don't even, I couldn't even tell you. It's too much nonsense. But anyway. He's, just, he's the, the devil and he's, yeah. having a, you know, whatever. It's yeah. the, the devil, Satan, who cares? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I when that <laughs> stuff comes on, I'm like, oh, I see why this appealed to you <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> when you were 17. Right, right. So like heavy metal listening, like, oh, I hate everybody. Fuck the world, Nate. Like I could see why you would like this. So um, the Undertaker comes out. And, but first, well, mankind. Yes, yeah. So he's fighting mankind. And mankind's thing is that he's kind of like this like tortured person who's like been twisted and warped by, mask, yeah, by years of abuse. And he wears like a crazy mask and he kind of lumbers around in a flannel yeah. like a... It, do, like, like, it doesn't even make he sense. He kind of looks like the way his, his body movements are and the way he holds himself reminds me of, of the main guy from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like mm -hmm. very twisted. Like I feel like yeah. he's kind of evoking yeah. that in his character. So anyway, mankind comes out, and he's like nutty. He's and carrying so they, a chair. He's carrying a chair, like a, a metal chair, and they lower the hell, the cell, the metal cage over the ring, and he kind of like looks around and he throws the chair up on top of the cell, and then this giant man with wrestling boots on proceeds to climb the chain link fence around the cell and he climbs to the top and you can see the weight giving underneath right. him as he's walking across the, the and, chain and, link. And uh, uh, for like a brief description for those few of you who are not familiar with Mankind or Mick Foley and what he physically looks like, Rachel did a good job of describing how he sort of moved, but he basically looks like if you took like a really out of shape 300 pound guy mm -hmm. and just like threw spandex on him yeah, and, and, a, and, a, and an office shirt and a tie. Like, yeah, just, yeah. Like, he doesn't look like he should be wrestling anything. Mm -mm. He kind of looks like the guy, the stapler guy from the office space, <laughs> if he had long hair and a mask. Right, yeah. right. So anyway, so he goes, Mick Foley, Mankind climbs on top of the thing. Then The Undertaker comes out, and it's like the bells and like the scary black music. Mm -hmm. And The Undertaker looks up, and so then he climbs on top of the cage. And then like the announcers are like, I think they're going to fight on top of the cage. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, like, no shit. They both these two giant men just climbed up there, duh. And the cage is like, I'd say like 20 feet, 16. It's built at 16 feet. Yeah, so it's 16 feet off the ground, right? So they start like fighting and wrestling and hitting each other with the chair on top of the cage, right? And then all of a sudden, uh, the Undertaker throws mankind <laughs> off of the cage into the announcer's corner. Mankind smack crashes through a table and everyone's like, the announcers are rolling with it, and they're like, oh, blah, 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 oh, is he like okay? He's dead. <laughs> he's dead. They broke him. That's a funny slide. One guy goes, they broke him in half. <laughs> so silly. And But I'm, like, watching it. Did my, like, jaw drop? Yeah, I kind of wish yeah. you well, had a video camera. Like, I, like, I, I wish I had, too, but, like, um, you know, I, I kind of knew it was coming, mm -hmm. but, like, it had been so long that I, since I'd seen it. Right. Like, I didn't realize it was so quick into the match yeah it was only like a couple of minutes no, like kinda, they were only up there like, like back yeah. and forth punch and kick in and then just all of a sudden boom throws them off yeah throws them off and then so there's a couple minutes of them trying to like figure it out or whatever and then like the a guy who plays the undertaker he's like standing on top of the cage and he's kind of like puffed up and looking around looking all mean looking down and like you can see in the camera he's like holding character but like 
if deep in his eyes and his soul, he's like, oh, shit, I hope he's okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but he's, like, totally, like, playing the character. He's all beefed up. And then so, like, they pull Mankind off on a stretcher, and they're pulling him back up the aisle towards the entrance. And then you see Mankind. They've taken off his mask because, like, they actually need to check if Mick Foley is, like, alive and breathing and okay. Right, right. So they, they did. But then somehow Mick Foley, the yeah. consummate professional, like pulls himself out of the stretcher and like staggers and wanders back to the cage, climbs back up to the top of the cage and continues fighting the Undertaker. And then they're fighting, fighting, fighting. Well, remember, the Undertaker's like seven foot something, 300 something. Mankind's like six foot five plus and 300 something heavy dude. So there's at least 600 pounds of weight on top of this cage. And like the ceiling of the cage is chain link fence. So at some point, both of them are walking on the chain link fence and all of a sudden the weight gives and Mick Foley, who's not wearing his mask anymore, falls whack and crashes through onto the mat. So 16 feet before, you know, Nathan told me afterwards, he's like, he whispered to the undertaker, throw me through the table. And he like angled his body and he had done this, he had done similar things enough. He was enough in tune with his body and what was happening that he could crash through the table. It was probably, he probably actually yeah. was hurt and got a concussion, but he did it in such a way that he didn't break his back. Right, right. When he fell from the ceiling, and Nathan told me all of this based on like an autobiography you had read yeah, or an interview some you had things, seen. Some things that I had read yeah. and, and some, some internet, you know, smarks right. talking about. So Mick Foley falls through the roof of the cell, uh-huh. hits all the way like on the mat and apparently that fall was physically like way worse because they didn't plan it they didn't know that the the roof was going to collapse like that on them so he falls through and crashes and then the right. chair it's like a dull thud in yeah the middle of yeah the ring. and you can see in his face because he's not wearing the mask that he's in like horrible pain when he falls but then uh, after he falls but as he's falling he hits the mat and then the chair falls through and hits him in the head and then hits the mat. So he's he's fallen he's fallen sixteen plus feet twice. And one time wasn't planned, so he couldn't prepare for the fall. And then a chair fucking hits him on the head. So it's crazy, right? And I'm just like, what? What? I was like, this I mean it's fake, but it's not freaking fake. Like it's like real, right? Then like the most disturbing thing happens. Like mankind's character had like a sack with him <laughs> and it, it was full of thumbtacks, right. like big well, industrial let's, office let's, thumbtacks. Let's hold on real quick cuz I I want to reestablish this. Like this wasn't enough for him. Oh yeah. Right, right. He he was like, "Oh my god, we're we're both like and I'd seen this before. I knew it was coming." But it was just like to see it again was like, "All right, just like that's the end of the match. Yeah, you could you just you right. could stop. Right. You could like, go home. Like, oh my god, you're you're clearly and the way he fell with this one, it was just it didn't look good. No. Right. It looked like it fucked him up. Yeah, it did. And like, oh, that was the other thing. His tooth came out and punctured the top of his lip. Right. So he had one of his teeth. His mouth was all bloody. One of his teeth, I looked like one of his incisors on the bottom had come out and had skewered the top of one of his lips so he had like a like a like a tooth sticking out of his lip almost into his nose so like if i'm understanding correct from what you told me they both they basically were like you know matches preset undertaker's gonna win right so sorry spoilers as far as i recall right, right. undertaker this happened was in 98 right so it's undertaker was ago. gonna win but they we're like, we'll keep going until you say I'm, I've had enough and we'll put on a good show for people. So dude falls twice, probably has two concussions. Teeth have been knocked out. They've been rammed through his face, been hit in the head with a chair. Not one that someone was throwing, but one that fell and hit him like with a full right. force of gravity, right? He takes this bag of thumbtacks. Right. And this is a thing that he's known for sort of. Yeah, this is kind of his shtick, right? Right. He takes a bag of thumbtacks, and the whole idea is, is that he's going to, like, sl- body slam the Undertaker into the thumbtacks. But then, you know, things get twisted around. Long story short, the Undertaker ends up body slamming him into the thumbtacks. But the thing that's crazy is that Mick Foley is, like, so amazing, the guy who played Mankind. Undertaker body slams him into the thumbtacks, but he doesn't really land in them. He kind of lands next to them. He gets a couple on his shoulder. But then he's like rolls into the thumbtacks, like does like a a barrel roll all the way through all the thumbtacks he dumped out. So this guy is just like, 
I, at this point, my mind is blown, right? So I won't go on about it anymore. Actually, there was one more match, but it's kind of like at that point, who cares? The crazy right. thing that I will mention about that, so the, the Undertaker ends up winning. Mankind goes off, and he's being, like, helped off by everybody. The final match happens with, like, um, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Kane. 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 So, but, like, kind of who cares? Right. But then, like, in the middle of that match... The Undertaker and Mankind come back out and end up helping Kane. And they, like, come in and they do some fun stuff and they, like, disappear. And I'm just like, oh, my God, Mick Foley, like, have a cup of coffee and take a break. Like, <laughs> like you were literally taken off in a stretcher and probably they thought that was going to be the end of it. And that right. was the end of the show. And then you were like, no, I'm good. I got this, guys. And came back. And Strangely. Just, oh, so crazy. My, my favorite part of that match mm -hmm. is uh, a guy by the name of Terry Funk. Okay. And um, and someday we're going to have to watch Beyond the Mat. And, okay. You know, the documentary. Yeah, yeah. So there's some documentaries. And um, the sort of aftermath of that match is in that documentary. But my, my, my favorite part of that is Terry Funk, mm -hmm. who's like, I don't know, he's got to be like in his 50s at this point. Because mm -hmm. he's, all, yeah, he's like 74 now. So he had to be like, anybody who's wrestling in their 50s needs to stop. Right. Right. Not Terry Funk. He don't care. So he comes out, and Terry Funk is kind of known for, like, really dramatically kind of, like, blurring the lines between fact and fiction with mm -hmm. wrestling. So he kind of fit right in at that time. And The Undertaker grabs Terry Funk and choke slams him out of his shoes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. So this is during the Mankind Undertaker match. Everyone's kind of coming in to get Mankind and, and, like, help him off after he's been, like, you know, hit down after the count. And Undertaker just picks Terry Funk up by the throat, this, like, seemingly innocent-looking man in his 50s, and choke slams him into the mat, and Terry Funk's shoes just fly off. So, like, his tennis shoes are, like, abandoned in the mat while he gets up and helps Mankind. That is, like, yeah, you're right. That's so funny. Yeah. I wonder, I bet it was intentional. He, like, didn't tie his shoes so that they would fly off. I don't know. Yeah, I don't... that's so funny. I forgot about his that. fucking Z-Boss But anyway, pants. you tell me your favorite thing about that rewatching it with me, and then I'll tell you my favorite thing. My favorite thing about rewatching it with you was um, the fact that you sat through the whole thing. I did. I watched the whole thing. And... Um, honestly, like you were kind of engaged through mm -hmm. it and, and, but uh, also my favorite thing too, was just being able to like rewatch it and be like, oh yeah, um, this, this doesn't, this isn't something I care about anymore. Right. <laughs> but like, I, I liked to be able to be like, Hey, this is what this is. And this is what this means. And like, give you the little insights and like, mm -hmm. like one, so this is going to be mean and, and, and I'm, I'm sorry that I'm saying it, but you got to have a little gallows humor, I think sometimes, but we were sitting there watching it, and I was, I was like, we should have, we should have a drinking game. And Rachel was like, what do you mean? And I was like, we just take a shot every time someone's, someone that's in the ring is dead, because there's so many people mm -hmm. from that time that have died that yeah. are deceased, like like. But not in Mick Foley. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. He's made every effort, but yeah. he's he's still here. Yeah. But yeah, there was just so many people. Like every every match, you'd see somebody, and you'd be like, "Oh, that that's yeah, that guy that guy's not here." Or, you know, China was like a big focus. Oh in yeah, it too. China and, was and, in the and she's, yeah, she's, passed, she's away. passed away. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it was just like to go back and see that was mm -hmm. kind of interesting, but to be able to like kind of explain it to you, right? And you you know vaguely seeming interested, yeah. Like that was I like really, I really was interested. I, I I think my favorite thing about it was um like if I had to obviously just how well it was so entertaining like the first couple of matches like were were silly and funny and like we could joke around about them and, and that's what what made them entertaining but like the main thing the hell in the cell i mean it was very compelling right and i i did kind of i didn't know who was gonna win and um i i really appreciated how if I had been there in that, and this is my favorite thing. If I had been there in the arena watching it with all of those people, it probably would be an experience I wouldn't forget for the rest of my life. Because you could tell the people who were there were just absolutely captivated. Oh my God. Like they and were like, so into it. And the feeling that that must have like from like all of these people in arena, you know, like just like just people watching these gladiators fight. And yeah. this wasn't like. You know, people watching the Mayweather 
um, you know, Conor McGregor fight. People were into that and they were excited for it. But this was like you could even through the screen, even like almost 20 years later, 20 years later, you could still feel like how excited people were and yeah. how how much how invested they were in these performers and just like the absolute amazing show that these wrestlers put on. And so I think that was my favorite thing was getting that sense from the fan, even over, you know, TV all these years later. That yeah. was really cool. Yeah. So, um, to compliment that, <laughs> uh, I, we did a Twitter poll on Nathan's other podcast, 25 years of vampire, the masquerade, which I think some people were like, why the fuck are you asking us about Disney movies? We're here for vampire. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> you just want to get as many people as you can. You yeah. Know? So, um, we were like, Hey, should Nathan watch, the Lion King? Should he watch Aladdin or another Disney movie? Well, I was just kind of interested to see what the response would be if he did that, and he politely obliged me. Um, but it really didn't matter how those people voted. If you are listening and you voted, I was always going to have him watch Aladdin. Uh, and there was a couple of reasons why I picked Aladdin specifically. So the first being that um, between, so I was I was going between Aladdin and The Lion King, right? And the first reason was was because I felt. The character of Aladdin was maybe someone more that Nathan could identify with than the character of Simba. And the reason being is, is Aladdin is like this, this diamond in the rough. He's this, this person who knows that he's worth a lot, that knows that he can do great things, but circumstances in his life being what he, he, they are, he just hasn't had that shot or that opportunity for greatness. And so I'm not saying that that is perfectly analogous by any means to Nathan, but, but you two are a guy who kind of like worked really hard in your 20s and had a job and you stuck it out and you did all these things but then you know kind of you were like oh, I can do more than this like I I can I can be more and so you you went through the hard um, exercise of going back to school and you did it and you did awesome and then you you were like you know I have these these interests and these things I love I'm gonna talk about them I'm gonna podcast I'm gonna you know get into broadcasting and now you're you're working in the business and and granted it's it's very much an entry-level position but it's like it's something you're passionate about that you really wanted to do and so you're you're a person who like knows your value knows your worth who I'm very proud of to know as a friend let alone you know more than that um and so I was like I feel like maybe Aladdin will speak to him more. If I'm going to make this man, this <laughs> this man in his late 30s, sit down and watch a Disney movie for children, it's I'm going to try to get it to like be something that he's going to be a loose bit interested in. The Lion King is basically just Hamlet in Africa. Uh -huh. Like, it's, you know, the whole idea of the Lion King is, is that, you know, he's born, his father, Mufasa, was the king. Mufasa was killed by his uncle. Uh, you know, Simba goes yeah. off into the jungle, comes back. It's like, it's I not mean, I really, you know, I felt like, kind of, I felt like I knew the story of a yeah. lot. Like I, it's one of those things like the Lion King is so monumental mm -hmm. culturally mm -hmm. that like you, it's kind of inescapable, right. right? Like, you know, the characters, like, you know, Hakuna Matata, right? Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't no, want to know Hakuna Matata. It was Matata. pervasive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, it's the same, same thing. Like in high school, like I knew who Austin, what Austin 316 right. was, even though I never watched wrestling, right. you can't get away from it. It was everywhere. Right? right. When we were kids, I would think I was like 10, you were like 13. Right. Right. So, um, that being said, and, and then also another thing is, is I, I, someone, someone who's listening, look this up and comment on our Twitter. Uh, if, if, if this is true, if you can find a link to it, but I seem to recall like in undergrad, you know, to get like some credit, I took an East English or a, 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 an East Asian cultures class. And I believe at the time the professor told me that the whole entire, um, plot it wasn't a shot for shot ripoff, but like the plot of the Lion King was ripped off of a Japanese anime um, that was a bit older. <laughs> that it was just like it was took place in Africa, had lions, same kind of storyline and everything. And so I was kind of like, ever since I heard that, I'm kind of like, come on, Disney, be better than that. I yeah, don't know why also, I was expecting like, Disney no, to be better than that. Disney's never been better than that. And, right. And so I feel like most normal people, mm -hmm. whatever that is, are probably going to be like, Okay, so you made her sit through what, like three hours of wrestling, mm -hmm. and all she did was make you watch Aladdin. Like, yeah. Aladdin is amazing, and Disney movies are great. Yeah. And you are right. Yes. Except I don't agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I need to I need to say this very plainly. This is a big effort on my part because I don't like Disney, mm -hmm. but more than I don't like Disney. In in so far as like their Disney movies, like mm -hmm. you know your Cinderellas and your you know whatnot, because um, 
uh, Disney owns Marvel, and uh, I like Marvel. You like Marvel. Um, but uh, more that I, I don't like Disney, I don't like things where there's singing in them. Yeah, that's really what puts you off. That's yeah. where the aversion musicals. is. Yeah, right. I yeah. don't. I don't enjoy musicals. Yeah, uh, I think music is for music, and uh, cartoons are for cartoons. Yeah, and never the two should meet. So that was something he commented on about 10 minutes into the movie. He's like, this would be better if there was no singing. Yeah. So let me kind of just, the, so I, I picked Aladdin. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Aladdin, The Lion King, the reason those are kind of like important to me and big in my life are kind of the same reasons that Jurassic Park and a few other movies and a few other cartoons that were on in the late or mid to late 90s were really important to me. And so this is just like, a little bit about me and my background. So my mom was a single parent and she worked a lot and she, oftentimes she worked nights. And so sometimes I would be by myself in the evening. Um, and you know, I was very much like a latchkey kid. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's basically like, you know, a kid whose parents work all the time. They have a key to the house. They come home, they lock the door. They don't answer the door for anybody. And you know, they're by themselves a lot or whatever. On top of that, I was an only child. So I spent a lot of time alone. And so in the evenings, um, you know, we didn't always have cable, but we always had a VHS player. And so, like, I basically had all, like, I had about five or six movies on VHS, and they were on constant rotation. And they were always on in the background, one, so that it would always sound like someone was home, and two, so I would, like, kind of never, uh, you know, be kind of bored or lonely. And, like, Aladdin and The Lion King and a few other movies were, like, the ones that were always, all, one of those was always in the VHS player playing. And, um, and so I knew all the songs. I knew all the words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she did. I, I know like scene for scene, there was a time like not anymore, but probably as recent as my late teens, early twenties, I could probably quote you a lot of the movie, right? I watched it a bunch. So that's why these movies were so important to me. And I would like, you know, it sounds kind of sad and pitiful, but I would like make believe that I was these characters and I would like act out the scenes as they were happening in the show. And so that was, that was why these movies were so impactful to me. And so, um, a little bit different than where Nate was coming from with the wrestling, but, um, <laughs> very different perhaps, <laughs> yeah. right? different circumstances, different, different time periods. But anyway, um, so we watched Aladdin. So Nate, I'll kind of let you take it here. What were your impressions, your thoughts? Um, so the first thing that I want to say is I want to give credit to this movie because like the evil villain was was like oozing evil. Oh yeah, right? Jaf Jafar. Right? Like, yeah. like they don't really ever explore motivations other than Jafar is like a power mad wannabe sorcerer. Right. Right. Like and he, there's like a cave and he wants a genie out yeah. of the cave, but he can't go in it. And right. he's he's like, uh, I'm gonna do whatever I have to to get it. And so like he just straight up mercs this fucking thief. Right. Like the thief comes, gives him the scarab, mm -hmm. and it like reveals this weird lion talking yeah. cave. And Jafar is just like, Hey, go on in there and you'll get all kinds of treasures. Mm -hmm. And of course the thief is like, Oh yes. He's a very stereotypical thief. Right. And he goes right in there, and that cave straight up murders him. Yeah. It's just like, no bullshit, yeah, he's first, dead. Yeah, first five minutes, or maybe five, ten minutes of the movie, yeah, character's yeah. dead. First and people death. are like, oh, right. no one no one ever dies in Disney movies. No, Not no. even the like, bad guys. That guy died. Yeah, that guy, that, he didn't that come... street thief straight up got murked. Yeah. Like, no, no judge, no jury, just straight up to execution. Mm -hmm. And, like, they designed this villain right. to look very serpentine mm -hmm. and, and very, like, very mercurial and mm -hmm. like like just you know like Slimy. right just like very pointy and mm -hmm. and um yeah but i mean it's uh you know i'll say i'll say for like for me and and this isn't really a it's it's not an insult to the movie but it's a very basic plot line right yeah. it's not it's not anything like it's not deeply advanced it's there's like a wizard and he wants like a powerful thing mm -hmm. and he uh, one thing that did strike me as odd was that, you know, like the, the diamond in the rough, like mm -hmm. that's something that's repeated yeah. numerous times. Like this cave will only allow someone that's a diamond in the rough. Mm -hmm. Like don't really understand. 
And, you know, granted, I may be thinking too deeply into this, mm-hmm. right? But, but so Jafar goes and does like a, a divining spell, right? Mm-hmm. And he finds that there's this street thief, Aladdin. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Aladdin is the only one that can enter the cave, right. right? So it was kind of like it was it was almost like it was predetermined, right? right. Like it was his destiny to go to this cave mm-hmm. to get this lamp. And my brain starts thinking, like, I'm like, what? okay, yeah, what, yeah. where is this going to go? It, yeah. But anyways, then we get into a sing dance number. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, ah, you fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? And also, um, I think that this movie had something that every movie everywhere needs, which is a um, cartoon caricature that uses Gilbert Gottfried's voice. Yeah, that's, that's what every movie's missing. <laughs> every every movie needs a really loud, obnoxious Gilbert Gottfried. Yeah. That's why Problem Child is my favorite movie, right? <laughs> so um, you have that. I forgot about Problem Child being a thing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, so there's a sing-dance number with, um, you know, lots of fat, Vaguely Middle Eastern fellas mm-hmm. uh, with swords. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And I was like, where is this? And you're like, oh, it's it's India. And I'm like, but is it? Yeah, I was like, like, I messed. Like, I was like, it's, it's India. And you're like, no, isn't it from like Arabian Nights? Right. And I'm like, okay, Saudi so Arabia. I don't know the right. desert. It's in a fictional location yeah. named Agrabah. Agrabah. Which, which, oh, which is like a vaguely yeah. Middle Eastern. But the, the Sultan is always saying like, Allah be praised. And, you know, right, oh, right. Allah help me. So and so it's somewhere in the Middle East. It's right. Yeah. It's, it's like... If, for like the hardcore nerds, it's like Arabian Nights, the Magic, the Gathering. It's mm-hmm. like it's vaguely, yeah, like geographically Arabic, yeah, but it yeah. doesn't mean anything. Right. right? It's just like whatever. Don't think too deep into it, because otherwise movie. it all unravels. Right. right. And uh, but there's a lot of singing, and I'm just like, <laughs> oh, like even my notes. Like I don't have a lot of notes because at a point, like I just get in and I just consume the movie. Right. 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 And, and, I, and I, I like I, I feel like to a certain degree. Like taking notes on every little detail of the movie actually like cheapens the experience, yeah. right? Because yeah. I just want to consume it as a whole. But I have to say, like for all the singing that was in this movie, it mm-hmm. was actually not a lot of singing comparative to other Disney movies. Uh, and somehow, very frantic animators turned Robin Williams into cartoon. I yeah. don't know how the fuck they did that. Yeah, it's actually pretty impressive when you watch, especially the part where they're still in the cave and like Robin Williams is doing his like, I'm the genie, you never had a friend like me. That all, mm. like, that's really mm. impressive. Oh, and uh, yeah, that's a point that I almost forgot. Um, that is what I would call the only acceptable singing in the entire freaking movie. Because, really? it, yeah, well, to me, all the other singing is like when a movie that's a musical breaks into singing. It's just like apropos of nothing. Mm -hmm. However, you have this genie Mm -hmm. who very quickly establishes that like the laws of reality don't really apply to him. Right. So he's like the only one that's really acceptable to like break out into singing. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, well, it's logical because he's like some weird interdimensional being who's been trapped in a bottle for 10,000 years. Yeah. So he can break out into song and like duplicate himself and do all this crazy stuff. And I can enjoy it, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm still, like, grounded in the reality of... Because I'm I, like... So, one of, the, one of the things that I asked you is I was like, why... What are the rules of this world? And you're like, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, how come the parrot can talk, but the monkey can't? And you're not the first person to ask that question. Right. Yeah. And I, but I still don't have, like, a solid answer. I don't know. Right? Because, like, the parrot could... Like the parrot had to pretend it couldn't talk, right? But the monkey was like smart enough to to like get human. So I think the monkey and the parrot both understood English, but only the parrot had the vocal capability to speak it, because it's like a parrot. Yeah, but like but he had to pretend. But like he had to pretend that he could only do like parrot talk, yeah. parrot talk. But like he could legit speak. So let me let me see. So Jafar is a wizard. Uh Maybe he, like, did some, like, you know, transfiguration, some wizarding to enable his annoying parrot to actually be able to have conversations with him because it was his only friend. And and the monkey is, like, a kleptomaniac, right? Because, like, like, he's the reason why that... They they get stuck in the cave. Right, right. Yeah. Um, So, like, what else about the movie did you... Did you... That stuck out to you? One thing I noticed as Mm -hmm. we were watching it, and you're like... Oh, that's where that comes from. Oh, yeah. So um, another key thing was that I learned that there are a number of, like, cultural things that that 
like even I say, mm -hmm. that I really didn't put a lot of thought into where they came from. I just mm -hmm. had picked them up throughout the years. One of them was Doubting Mustafa. Mm -hmm. Like I say that, like I know so many people yeah. that say that. Someone in the movie was like, don't be a Doubting Mustafa. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, that's where that comes from. Mm -hmm. And like the whole new world, like I knew that song. Right. But I didn't know it came from Aladdin. Oh, really? You didn't no. know it came from no, Aladdin? No, I didn't know it came huh. from Aladdin. But like I knew it. Mm -hmm. Like I knew words to the song. Mm -hmm. But I'd never seen the movie. That's the one song where I really broke and couldn't hold it anymore and had to sing along. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I'm so sorry, but it's happening. Right. And you're like, why do I know this song? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I have to say, like, obviously, it's a 90 minute Disney movie. Mm -hmm. And it's like uh, Aladdin uh, is kind of a douchebag because mm -hmm. he like and I'll tell you why I'll, I'll qualify that um, because he doesn't seem to understand like telling the truth is like a good thing. Yeah, well, I would say yeah, the, he he kind of knows right from wrong and he knows sure. you should tell the truth, but he's kind of like insecure and so that's why he's lying. Uh -huh. yeah. I don't think it's like he's like a douche cuz he's like he wants uh, to actively make bad decisions. I think it's all it's like most bad decisions. Mm -hmm. It's like when most people are assholes, like when we eventually get trolled because of this cuz like no one cares. Right. Uh it's be it's because of insecurity. Right. So. I I just felt that um certain things um would have would have uh i don't know you know maybe i would i would have made him a better oh yeah so the one thing that i was like huh so he's in love with jasmine mm -hmm. right and jasmine mm -hmm. is in love with him and is just devastated wrecked because uh the jafar that's the yeah. magician um has him beheaded right? right we know that's not really what happened but that's the lie that he tells to jasmine mm -hmm. sorry we thought he kidnapped you we had him beheaded so then uh, his wish, mm -hmm. because he's in love with Jasmine, mm -hmm. is to become a prince. Because she can only marry a prince. Right. Because that's the law, even though her dad is the... Anyways, don't yeah. think too deeply into yeah, it because he it could just right. change the law. Right. Um, so anyways, he says, well, I want to become a prince. Mm -hmm. And so the genie's like, Alakazam, done. You're a prince. Here's like a thousand soldiers and fucking... I'll turn your monkey into an elephant and you like yeah. just crazy. Right. Mm -hmm. He's got a flying carpet and he mm -hmm. shows up and Jasmine doesn't recognize him. Yeah. Cause he's wearing a hat. Cause he's wearing a hat. Yeah. Right. And then he's like, Oh, I can't take my hat off cause she'll recognize me. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I, I was like, you know, I'm fairly certain that if Rachel <laughs> went and like put on like a very elaborate dress, yeah. but then like also put a hat on, <laughs> like I'd probably still recognize you. I wouldn't be like, is that you, Rachel? And you'd be like, no, 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 I'm, I'm Rochelle, the princess. And I'd be like, I don't know. But I guess you're probably like, how would you have that elaborate dress if you weren't a princess? Like, that was just like, are you expecting me to understand that, like, or to believe that they don't, like, she doesn't recognize him? Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, no. That actually makes a lot of sense. Does it? Yeah. How? Because, like... She's a princess, mm -hmm. and she was with him for, like, 45 minutes. True. So, yeah. so like, why the fuck would she recognize him? Yeah, it's not like they took a selfie together. Right. Mm -hmm. They've been, they, they hung out together for 45 minutes, and also it was a very frantic 45 minutes. Right. Wherein they only ever got to sit next to each other for just a few moments mm -hmm. before the guards came and took him away. Right. So she didn't know who he was. She right. just, like, there was this idea. Mm hmm Right? And then, like, w when when... You know, they do the prince princess thing like they still don't spend a lot of time together. Right. And I was just like, OK, I don't know what lessons trying to be taught here, but mm -hmm. maybe I should just tr stop trying to take one away <laughs> and just realize that it's like kind of a silly kids movie mm -hmm. and that it really doesn't hold up to like deep scrutiny because mm -mm. it's like not really meant to be. No. However, again, I have to give credit to Disney because like Jafar was just like a bad like, he was just evil as fuck. Yeah, he right? was, like, super evil. And and he was, like, power mad, mm -hmm. right? And, again, I don't know what his motivations were. He just wanted to, like, be in charge of everything. Yeah, he wanted to be the most powerful being in the universe. Right. He was just like, I want to be the, the biggest. And he was just, like, you know, I like, turned into a giant serpent mm -hmm. and, like had the genie, like, tear the, the, the tent, like, the castle or whatever mm -hmm. you call it. Yeah tear it up and put it on like this big pedestal and just like yeah. he was just majorly insecure mm -hmm. but like to what end i really like i would like to explore more into jafar 
Yeah. And how, like, he became so power mad and, like, what his origins are like. Mm. Because, like, he was, like, legit didn't give a shit evil. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I like that. But I want to explore more. I'd like to know more. Um, well, they made some sequels, straight to DVD sequels. Probably Maybe, not good. No, yeah, probably I not. I mean, I mean, look, I'll Maybe tell you Maybe like Jafar's in them, probably not. So, he got turned into a genie and then right. kicked kicked around. So. so so the story ends that the genie um, gets set free. Jafar mm-hmm. ends up locked up in a bottle. And again, if you haven't seen this in 20 years, yeah. like... You don't deserve spoiler Yeah, alerts. basically Aladdin tricks Jafar into wishing that he was a genie, and then the side effect of that is is that he gets locked in a lamp. Oh, yeah, and then uh, Aladdin, um, his last wish is to set the genie free, and the genie's like, cool, peace him out, and then he goes off to be the guy at the beginning of the movie, um, or whatever, I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, um, all right, my, my, uh, my opinion of this movie. Yeah. Um, surprisingly enjoyable. Yeah? Yeah. Despite the singing. So the singing was kind of like, you know, obviously it's not something I enjoy. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that I would like to sit through again. Right. However, none of of the songs, none of the sing-songy parts are really long enough to like really great on me. And in fact, like. It almost seems like it, like most of the sing songing, with the exception of like a whole new world, and the genie, like they just they really didn't even need to be there. Yeah, right. I th- I feel like they were just used to sort of like at the very beginning, just sort of like tell you who Aladdin is, and mm-hmm. he's just like gotta 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 live to gotta eat to live, gotta steal to eat. Like, tell you all about it when I got the time. Right, right. Yeah. I don't I don't know the songs, but like I get a, yeah, yeah. I get a general gist. So like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm I'm a street urchin, I'm a thief, right? But I'm smart and I'm I'm sassy and yeah. you know, I'm scrappy. Right. Um, but I didn't really think it was necessary. However, it is what it is, right? It's in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I can tell you that I have watched other Disney movies with much m- more longer singing mm-hmm. that I wanted to like. I just wanted to like end it yeah. all. I was just like, nah, this is not, I can't do it. But Aladdin wasn't bad. Right. And honestly, the animation and like, Robin Williams, like yeah, I like, was going to ask you. You haven't brought up Robin Williams much. Yeah, what, well, any thoughts or feelings about that? So, like, Robin Williams is Robin Williams, right? right yeah. Like, like he's the only guy you could ever just be like, we don't care. Like, here, break all the fourth walls. Like, we don't, we don't mm-hmm. care. Like, your humor, like the fact that they, they like he did a Jack Nicholson impression. Yeah, and like they animated him looking like Jack Nicholson leads me to believe that they were just like. All right, we're not even going to get started on this part of the animation. Mm-hmm. We're just going to let you record. Here's a vague script. Just go. Right. And he did. And then they were like, all right, now let's try to animate this. Right. And I I guess it's probably how you work with someone that was like as frantic as Robin Williams was. Mm-hmm. But like, obviously, he's also sort of included so that the adults, the right. parents can laugh too. Right. And I think that they did a really good job because mm-hmm. Robin Williams is very distinct. Mm-hmm. He has a very interesting humor about him, and he's just kind of like free flowing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think for that alone, it was kind of worth watching the movie. Right? Um, you know, Robin Williams. Like, what else can you say? Like, nobody's like Robin Williams. Right. So. I'll tell you my favorite thing, and then you tell me your favorite thing. Mm-hmm. So my favorite thing about rewatching this with you was a little selfish because I realized I hadn't seen it in so long that even though I remembered all of it, there were things that I understood now that I didn't understand then. Like, uh, for example, Jafar's title, like it, like words or phrases. Yeah, vizier. vizier. Yeah. Jafar's title was Vizier. And I was like, I don't think I knew what a Vizier was when I was a kid. Like, I didn't know what that word meant. And then, like, other... You know, you said that Robin Williams was there for the adults, right? So looking back on it, there were certain jokes that like now I get, mm-hmm. but I didn't get at the time because they were referencing something I didn't know anything right. about, right? Um, like the Jack Nicholson thing. Like probably I would have gotten that when I was a kid, but like now I think I like I'm like, oh, that's his Jack Nichol. You know, um, so that's what I enjoyed was like catching the things that I didn't get when I was a kid. So I mean, because I probably haven't seen that movie. It's like sat down and just watched Aladdin since I was like. 12, 13 years yeah. old. So, Well, I, I would say that my favorite thing about the movie was um, it was kind of ballsy. 
Yeah. Right? Like it like it it was like watching it, I was like, this I could see how this could be like a little scary for, for you a know, little kid. For a little yeah. kid, right? Because yeah. it was just like I don't know if maybe they just didn't fuck around as much back in the nineties and the eighties. Well, I'll but tell you like, what, some of the Pixar movies, which I don't think you've probably seen many of, uh-uh. um, some of the Pixar movies can be kind of scary and have like pretty deep, heavy stuff like the death of a parent or like really scary magic and things like that. So I think Disney has probably always, at least since the nineties, I don't, well, I mean, even maybe like going back in some of the older ones have, has dealt with pretty dark themes. Um, and in like a fun, lighthearted way, because it's like, on the one hand, maybe that's the responsible thing to do, because it's like, it can't just all be, be all fun all the time, right? right. Like even little kids can experience tragedy or they can, ex- they can understand loss, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, maybe these types of cartoons are a good way for kids to like be able to process that in right. a safe way. Well, and, and it's clear that they're, they're like kind of giving a message, right? Like mm-hmm. they're saying like, you know, here's this, this guy, Aladdin, who's kind of like lived off of his his skills mm-hmm. and he's embarrassed of who he is. But like, here's this this princess right. who doesn't care and mm-hmm. never cared and more troubles sort of arose from his inability to just be, be accepting of who he is. Right. And if he, you know, and then once he finally realized, like, I just be myself because that's that's who's best. Right. You know, he was able to overcome obstacles. Is that is that a useful or realistic lesson? I mean, I think it is because yeah. I think, you know, I think it's a useful, useful lesson. I don't know if, if kids grab hold of that being like a lesson of the movie. But I think when you look back on your life and you look at of decisions you've made and, you, you you know, like and I say you, it's like, you know, you, yeah, whoever. It's me. You, yeah. yeah, it's like and you look at decisions you've made like out of fear or lies you've told yourself that you knew were lies at the time. And it's like kind of lying to yourself about who you are mm-hmm. or making decisions out of fear. It ultimately hurts you, but right. it kind of also starts to permeate and hurt other people around you. And that's what happened in the story, right? Like Aladdin is like trying to lie and isn't being acceptive and loving of who he is. And then he ends up hurting not only himself, but he hurts Jasmine. He hurts uh, Abu. He hurts the genie. So his lies and his... His um, not being accepting and kind to himself hurts everybody around him who cares about him, too. And so I think that that's like a pretty common theme in a lot of movies and books and TV shows. And it's kind of like a universal human lesson that we all kind of have to learn eventually. Yeah. So Well, um, and now, uh, like how I know it's kind of worked on me. Mm -hmm. Um, now I want to like explore deeper. Like why was Aladdin the only one able to open that cave? Like what's, what's going on with his destiny? And, but I'm not going to. Yeah, no, that's, that's, (laughs) that's for, uh, so I don't, I wouldn't expect you to write any Aladdin fan fiction. No, no, definitely. (laughs) I'm not going to be writing any Aladdin fan fiction. However, like, you know, now, and you would ask me like, all right, it's over. Like, you know, are you never going to watch it again? Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, like that, I would actually like if it was on, mm-hmm. you know, you're, let's say in a purely hypothetical, I'm making this up in my head. Like, you know, you're at a family member's house and Aladdin's playing for the kids on Christmas or whatever. Like I'd sit down and watch it yeah, because it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. It was, you know, I thought it was fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that it's, it's given me, it's given me warrant to be a little bit more open to, you know, like quote unquote kids movies. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I've always kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm the diehard guy, right? Yeah. If there's not like guns and explosions in it, then I'm like, I don't give a fuck, right? <laughs> but like, also, like, it's it, the animation was really good for the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like something that culturally people like. So, you know, maybe yeah. be a little bit more open to it. And, and I think now is the only real time in my life I really had the capacity to do that. Mm. You know, like, I, I've always been like so like hardcore Mm -hmm. with like my nerd stuff that like, I don't care about your stupid shit. Like, I don't like it. But like, you know, now I'm in my thirties and I'm, I'm, you know, Mm -hmm. getting on an age, like be open to it. Right. Cause you never know, you might like it. So try it out. And I would say, 
I'd, I'd give it like a B, you yeah. know? Yeah. Okay. You know, you give it, 11, it wasn't, it it's not something that I'm necessarily going to add to regular rotation. Right, right, right. But it's not something I'm going to be like, no, I can't. Cool. That's stupid and I don't like it. Well, I think just because of your strong aversion to the music, I think I'm going to scratch off the list of things to share with you, Ham- <laughs> Hamilton, because that's just... I mean, I, look. I'm going to probably f- go ahead and go forth with the Phantom of the Opera, but the Hamilton, I feel like, is just a level of annoying that you're not going to be able to deal with. I mean, I'm going to leave the, but I'm going to leave Phantom of the Opera on there, uh-huh. and I'm going to leave Rocky Horror Picture Show on there, but not Rocky Horror Picture Show. We're going to go see Rocky Horror Show okay. in October. Well, look, I, you you went and you saw the room with me, right? But I loved it. Right. Yeah. And so. If you're like, hey, I want to go see this thing, Mm -hmm. I'm going to be like, yeah, okay, let's go see it. So anyways, that's like the roundup of our experience from the week. So let's let's take a look at our list and see what we want to sort of look into, talk about, read, experience over the course of the week. So I'm just going to scratch out the pro wrestling. Yeah, you can scratch out Lion King and Aladdin. Okay. Yeah. So I guess I guess you're next on the list. Well, what if I pick a thing from yours? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so let's see here. Um, all right, so we've done kind of like lighthearted, campy stuff. I mm-hmm. would even call that extreme wrestling match. Yeah. You know, kind of lighthearted and campy. So let's do um, something a bit grittier. Yeah. Um, let's go full on apocalypse now. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so next uh, next podcast uh, again, we we have no actual schedule. We, right. You know, this is going to kind of roll out when it rolls out. So, you have suggested Apocalypse Now yeah. as a masterpiece of uh, of Vietnam era. Sure. Movie. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch Apocalypse. You're gonna expose me to Apocalypse right. Now. So I think we've already kind of gotten started on this, but mm-hmm. um, I think we maybe need to take a deep dive into the Star Trek. Okay. Sounds good. We, we watched an episode today before we recorded this podcast, and we mentioned it at the beginning, and I was kind of like, don't turn it off. <laughs> so I, I, it's something I'm eager mm-hmm. to know a little bit more about, whether that's like, you know, I start with you and, and sure. watch with you, or I, you know, kind of watch on my own a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of curate a list mm-hmm. of um, maybe, maybe like... Two or three, maybe like two episodes of the next generation that I think are like must must watches, mm-hmm. right? And then maybe also an episode of um, Deep Space Nine, yeah. which I also really like. And then maybe like one episode of the original series. Okay. Um, and if you have time, mm-hmm. you can watch them on your own, or watch we can watch them together after yeah. dinner or, or something. Well, like I'm gonna that. I'm gonna um, sit and watch Apocalypse Now with you. Yeah. Um, because mm-hmm. uh, I I want I I love Apocalypse Now. I think right. it's one of the best movies ever made. Yeah, and, I can't wait to see it. Um, yeah, can't believe so, I've never seen it. No, it's 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 a uh, very heavy mm-hmm. movie. Okay. <laughs> so it's kind of like eating. Like a really thick bowl of ramen, okay, with like lots of salty soy sauce on it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like I don't know if that's even appropriate, but like you know, it's just like big chunks of pork. There's yeah. a lot to chew on, yeah. You know, so I I, I love no to fluff. watch it. There's n- very little fluff. Yeah, who's the director? Is a Scorsese? Coppola. Coppola? Mm-hmm. Oh, I love Coppola. Yeah, yeah. So, um, all right. So next podcast. Um, by then, we should be up on iTunes. I'm going to make every effort to get that done this week. We are going to be talking about Apocalypse Now mm-hmm. and Star Trek, two very different worlds. Super different, but, you know, whatever. Yeah, but, Who cares? but, but equal in the yeah. middle. So, cool. uh, yeah, thank you guys for listening. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Um, do you have anything you'd like to say before we um, close up the shop here? Not really. Just hopefully if you... You know, if you're if you came to this through iTunes, you know, go ahead and rate us, write a review that helps us, you know, reach more people. Um, If you like what we're talking about and you want to share it with your friends. Awesome. Um, Yeah. So don't be afraid to to share this around and um, check out the other podcasts that we have, whether it's Nerdwerves or 25 Years of Vampire the Masquerade. If you're finding us for the first time, you can follow us on Twitter at Hookie Podcast. Uh, you can follow Nate on Twitter um, at Utility Muffin Labs, or is it 25 VTM? VTM 25. Anyways, you you can find all that information at utilitymuffinlabs.com. And mm-hmm. we're going to have a little recap at the end of the episode. Oh, anyways, that's right. A little commercial. Because, right, because Rachel was kind enough to lend her voice. 
mm. to a self promoting little oh, commercial yeah, yeah. little bit. Totally. Anyways, uh, thank you guys. And also, I think it's really important to state if you guys like what we're doing and mm-hmm. you want to like lend suggestions to us of like how we could improve the podcast or like things you'd like us to talk about. If we're interested and we haven't mentioned it, like definitely do that. Yeah. We're, and yeah. if you if you heard anything in the podcast that you want to comment on um please hit up our twitter uh you know if there's something we said that was a mistake or if you have some insight that we didn't share that you think is really important for other listeners to hear about feel free to you know leave us a comment on our twitter page yep Yep. cool all righty guys well until next time i'm nathan and i am rachel and we'll talk to you again soon bye 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 hey folks this is rachel from utilitymuffinlabs.com If you enjoyed the Playing Hooky podcast, think about supporting us. For more podcasts, art, videos, and gaming, go to utilitymuffinlabs.com. Follow our podcast on Twitter, at Hooky Podcast, on Instagram and Facebook at our Utility Muffin Labs name, and support us on YouTube at Utility Muffin Labs. Check out our other gaming-related podcasts, 25 Years of Vampire the Masquerade and the Nerd Words Podcast. Thank you all for your support. Utility Muffin Labs, consistently rated adequate.